Welcome to the third hour of constitutional law. The subject for this hour is the rise and fall and rise of substantive due process. Let's begin by revisiting Marbury versus Madison briefly. In the first of these lectures, you heard of the close connection between the traditional or narrow reading of Marbury versus Madison and an interpretivist approach to constitutional law. Basically, the interpretivist approach tries to treat the Constitution as law and to find meaning in the text, the history, the precedents, and the structure of the document. According to Chief Justice Marshall and Marbury, the power of judicial review arose because the court had to decide the case before it in accordance with law. That meant the court had to decide the case in a conformity with the Constitution and inconsistent statutes had to be ignored. As you heard, the key to this traditional reading of Marbury is the conclusion that the Constitution is law, not just a statement of political ideals. And the interpretive, uh, interpretivist approach to con law means simply that the Constitution should be interpreted more or less like any other kind of law. More simply still, that the Constitution is law, not politics. Now, it is certainly possible to believe, and many very smart people do, that con law should be completely interpretivist. It is certainly possible to believe that the judges should limit themselves to legal interpretation of the document, and not bring anything to it that they don't find there. It's possible to believe these things should be true, but it is not possible to believe that they are true in the Constitution as the Supreme Court has, in fact, construed it. There are con law decisions that simply cannot be understood as interpretation of the Constitution in any traditional sense. There are constitutional rights that are non-textual. That is, rights not found in the Constitution, but rights put there by judges. This approach to con law is old and venerable. It used to be called the natural law approach, and sometimes still is. Others prefer to call it the fundamental rights or fundamental values approach. Whatever label you prefer, the essential idea is the same. Some rights are in the Constitution, not because the document can fairly be interpreted to say so, but because they are simply too important to be left out. That, in a simplistic nutshell, is the fundamental rights approach, that some rights are so fundamental, so important, so essential, to a conception of ordered liberty, that they are in the Constitution even though the document cannot fairly be interpreted to say so. One very important thing about the fundamental rights approach is that it is more or less frankly political. Now, by using the word political, I certainly don't mean partisan. I don't mean that the courts ever try to support one political party over the other. I just mean that the fundamental rights approach more or less openly embraces the idea that judges should attribute to the Constitution whatever justice requires. And one's conception of what justice requires will necessarily be, in some sense, political. Now, some of you may think that creating constitutional rights in this way, judges deciding for themselves what they should regard as fundamental or not, is entirely illegitimate. You're entitled to that position, but don't take it too quickly. Surprisingly, there is some textual basis for enforcing non-textual rights. The Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. 
the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights, such as free speech, privilege against self-incrimination, shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Now, no one is exactly sure what that means, but it seems to say that there are constitutional rights not enumerated in the Constitution. If so, what are they? Where do they come from? That's the kind of question fundamental rights address. Similarly, the 14th Amendment declares, No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. Now, the 14th Amendment doesn't say what those privileges and immunities are. It just says that they shall not be abridged. Perfectly possible to believe, and some very smart people do believe, that the phrase privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States incorporates non-textual rights. That is, incorporates rights that are not spelled out in the Constitution. So, at least on one reading... The 14th Amendment, like the 9th Amendment, directs judges to enforce rights not spelled out in the Constitution. Or to put the matter differently, this is the sort of thing that makes one's head swim, the text of the Constitution requires enforcement of non-textual rights. Now, I think logically that the home of non-textual rights might be the Ninth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment, but historically, it was the Due Process Clause. And the doctrine, the doctrinal home of substantive uh, uh, fundamental rights is substantive due process. Uh, That phrase is actually a contradiction in terms. The 5th and 14th Amendments have parallel provisions. They say that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, this language requires process, that is, procedure. And, of course, there's a body of law, procedural due process, that deals with the right to notice and to hearing. But according to the Supreme Court, The due process clauses not only require procedure, they also have a substantive dimension. Namely, that some interest in life, liberty, and property are so important, some interests are so fundamental, that the government cannot infringe them absent a very powerful justification. That's what the Supreme Court means by fundamental rights. It means that the court's will demand a very powerful justification for infringing certain interests. The question, of course, it's a question you've heard in a basic con law course. Every course I've ever seen grapples with the problem. What are those interests? Where do they come from? How do judges discover what they are? And what gives judges the right to decide for the rest of us what is and what is not fundamental? That's the issue. Here's an overview of its history. The title of this lecture is The Rise and Fall and Rise of Substantive Due Process, and that describes its history. First, the rise. The flourishing of substantive due process is known by the name of a particular case, known to everyone who's ever studied con law, Lochner versus New York, decided in 1905. Lochner struck down a New York statute limiting the week of bakery employees to 60 hours. In striking down this statute, the Supreme Court limited both the ends the state could pursue and the means chosen to reach those ends. Let me elaborate. First, the ends. Today, the Lochner statute would be justified straightforwardly as a labor law. That is, the law saying bakery employees cannot work more than 60 hours would be justified as legal protection of bakery employees against economic exploitation. That end, that objective, 
was rejected by the Supreme Court on the ground that it interfered with workers' liberty of contract. Here's what the Supreme Court said. Viewed strictly as a labor law, the statute does not affect the safety of morals or welfare of the public as a whole. Instead, it intervenes in the labor marketplace to pr protect a particular group, to advantage a particular group of people. In today's lingo, we would call this special interest legislation, meaning that it was designed to better the welfare of some particular group, bakery employees. And the Supreme Court said, you can't pursue special interest legislation. It's not a permissible end. Now, Lochner also restricted the choice of means. The state actually tried to defend the statute as a health law. It said limiting bakery employees to 60 hours a week will increase the health of the public because they'll make better, healthier bread and people will not be afflicted with impurities. And the Supreme Court said, well, health laws are perfectly valid, but this is not a sensible means to ensure the public health. They looked at the means ends fit and determined that the law was not sufficiently adapted to the end of public health to justify interfering with liberty of contract. Now, here's a, what I think is an extremely important point about Lochner and all subsequent such cases. Note that the means ends inquiries are linked. If all ends are allowed, the inquiry into means disappears. Any means chosen is closely related to some end. This is just a tautology. Any means chosen is well adapted to do something. If anything you want to do is permissible, then the means will always be permissible as well. If there is no restriction on ends, there is no restriction on means. On the other hand, if some ends are disallowed, if some ends are rejected as impermissible, it is essential to police the choice of means. Why? Because the legislature will assert a legitimate end as a subterfuge. They will say it's a health law when it's really a labor law. And if they cannot pass labor laws, you have to look at health laws to make sure they're not indirect means of addressing an illegitimate end. So if you're going to disallow ends, you have to police means to make sure there's not subterfuge and evasion. Lochner illustrates both halves of this approach. One end, the wealth transfer to employed bakers, was rejected as substantively impermissible. Another end, the protection of health, was accepted, but the law was closely examined and found wanting as a means. If, if the courts are going to police legislative choice, both ends and means must be examined. Now, the Lochner era lasted 40 years, more or less, from 1897 to the mid-1930s. And during that period, many laws were struck down, a total of perhaps 200 state statutes struck down, most of them dealing with things like regulation of wages and prices, hours and business opportunities. But even during the height of the Lochner era, many such laws were upheld. Lochner does not stand for the proposition that there can never be regulation of economic activity. Lochner stands for the proposition that the courts decide whether there's a good enough reason to regulate economic activity. So that the key to Lochner is judicial intervention to protect economic liberty. The fall of substantive due process. Most people date the fall of substantive due process from Nebbia versus New York, 1934. West Coast Hotel versus Paris, 1937. These cases are not in themselves terribly important. They just are the dates of a shift in the Supreme Court's approach. Nebbia, the Supreme Court, upheld a state law fixing milk prices and upheld it for what it truly was, 
economic protection for dairy farmers. In West Coast Hotel, the Supreme Court sustained a minimum wage law for women, which directly overruled the 1923 decision striking down a similar law. The key to these statutes, to these cases, is that Nebbia and West Coast Hotel accepted as a legitimate end of government regulating economic activity to avoid exploitation. They accepted as a legitimate end of government special interest legislation. That's kind of a, a, a nasty label, but the idea is they accepted that the legislature can regulate economic activity to aid some group, such as dairy farmers or women workers. Now, soon after the decisions in Nebbia and West Coast Hotel, Lochner became a term of opprobrium. By the end of the 1940s, the Supreme Court was very skittish about Lochner and soon was in full flight. The Supreme Court began to say things like this, we will uphold economic regulation if any known or reasonably inferable set of facts supports the legislative judgment. Many of you will have read a case illustrating the withdrawal from Lochner. One of the best cases is Williamson versus Lee Optical, but there are several. By the 1950s, the court had abdicated any role whatever in policing economic regulation. Let me describe Williamson versus Lee Optical very briefly. The statute in that case prohibited opticians, people who sell eyeglasses, from supplying new frames or providing new lenses without a prescription. Now, the prescription can be pres provided by an ophthalmologist, who's a genuine medical doctor, or by an optometrist, who also sells glasses. So what's the effect of this law? The effect of the law is to drive opticians out of business and to give optometrists a virtual monopoly on the simple task of replacing lenses or selling new frames. This is special interest legislation, one group one in the legislature, another group laws. But the Supreme Court upheld the law on the basis of pure speculation about public health interests that the legislature might have concluded were involved in eyeglass lens replacement. Now, the truth is, the legislature would have had to have a room temperature IQ to believe the public health arguments advanced in the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court didn't trouble itself with whether the legislature actually had any public health concerns. They didn't trouble themselves with whether the public health concerns were plausible or reasonable or persuasive or documented. They just said, someone could believe this, and that's good enough for us. That's what I mean by abdication. I mean that by the 1950s, when Williamson versus Lee Optical was decided, the Supreme Court had completely withdrawn from reviewing economic legislation and accepted anything on the basis of what someone might have thought necessary. Now, that's the fall of substantive due process, and the third step is the rise again, which is, of course, Griswold and Roe. Let me start a little farther back. Even as the Supreme Court withdrew from meaningful review of economic legislation, there was another branch of substantive due process that survived intact. These are older cases, which you might, I would doubt you've read them, but you might have read their names. Meyer versus Nebraska struck down a state law prohibiting the teaching of foreign languages to young children. Pierce versus Society of Sisters struck down a state law requiring children to attend public school, not merely private or parochial school. Now, here's the key. Historically, analytically, intellectually, Meyer versus Nebraska and Pierce versus Society of Sisters were Lochner cases. In 1923, there was no distinction drawn between 
economic liberties, and other liberties. Here, Justice James McReynolds, a genuine reactionary, discussing what Lochner means. Liberty, McReynolds wrote. This is uh, 1923. Liberty, McReynolds wrote, denotes not merely freedom from bodily restraint, but also the right of the individual to contract, to engage in any of the common occupations of life to acquire useful knowledge, to marry, establish a home, and bring up children, to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience, and generally to enjoy those privileges long recognized at common law as essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. For James MacReynolds, Lochner, Meyer, Pierce were a seamless web. But in the aftermath of the Depression, the Supreme Court withdrew from, from scrutinizing economic regulation, but continued to look at so-called personal rights. The case that really revived substantive due process for personal rights is, of course, Griswold versus Connecticut, 1965. As you all know, Griswold struck down a law prohibiting the use of contraceptives. This was substantive due process in all but name. But by 1965, the revulsion from Lochner, the sense that Lochner was an epithet, was so great that the Supreme Court didn't want any association with that tradition. So the court not only avoided calling Griswold substantive due process, it specifically disavowed that idea. Now, you know what happened. Justice Douglas said, this is absolutely not specific, this is absolutely not substantive due process. It's something entirely different. And when he began to tell us what it was, he came up with a circumlocution that quickly became a figure of fun. Namely, that the right to use contraceptives was created by emanations from more specific constitutional guarantees that form penumbras or half shadows around textual rights. And from 1965 on, people have poked fun at the notion of emanations from penumbras as a source of constitutional adjudication. In subsequent years, the Supreme Court has not gone back to talking about emanations from penumbras, but it has followed another of Justice Douglas's phrases, right of privacy. And today, the modern substantive due process cases are likely to be known to you as right of privacy cases, such as Griswold versus Connecticut. Of course, calling something a right of privacy hardly solves the problem of where the right comes from. Remember, the word privacy nowhere appears in the Constitution. So saying something is part of the right of privacy just pushes the question one step further back. Well, okay, fine. Where does privacy come from? But the advantage of the right of privacy label was that it disguised the link between Griswold and Lochner. Whatever the label, the message is the same. Substantive due process, fundamental rights are alive and well for certain personal rights, even if not for economic liberty. Substantive due process is alive and well for certain personal rights, even if it is dead for economic liberties. Griswold, of course, provided support for the most important of all privacy decisions, Roe versus Wade. Today, constitutional law is preoccupied with Roe versus Wade. Indeed, it is not too much to say that much of modern con law theory is devoted to the task of explaining why Roe versus Wade was rightly decided and Lochner versus New York was wrongly decided. Of course, I don't mean to say that everyone thinks Roe was right. On the contrary, both as constitutional law and as 
public policy, abortion remains deeply and durably divisive. But for those who support Roe, and I would guess that most professors support Roe, the challenge is to explain why Roe was rightly decided and Lochner not rightly decided, what the difference is between them. Now, at one level, that task is easy. If you are willing to say that con law is simply politics, if you are willing to say that constitutional law is another branch of politics, pure and simple, that every constitutional question should be answered as a political judgment, then the question is easy. On that view, Roe is good law if it's good politics. And Lochner is bad law because it was bad politics. And the choice between them is simply a political choice between results you like and results you don't like. But if con law is something other than pure politics, if it is law, then Roe is very hard indeed. After all, there's no mention of abortion in the text of the Constitution. So far as I know, there's absolutely nothing in the history of the document that suggests the framers ever thought of it or thought that it was included as a protected liberty. There's nothing in the structure of the Constitution, the separation of powers or the federal system that says anything about abortion. So where does the right of abortion come from and how did it get in the Constitution? That's the basic question about all fundamental rights. Where do they come from? How do they get in the Constitution? Abortion is simply the most important and controversial example of that issue. Well, I'm quite sure that these are questions you have discussed at length in your con law class. You know the questions. You probably know how your professor would answer them. That's certainly the starting point for your exam. Again, I'm not saying this is a point I'll make several times with you. I'm emphatically not saying that you should parrot your professor's views and repeat back everything he or she believes. Professors do not expect that. Indeed, the good ones don't even like it. But you should take account of your professor's position. You should answer his or her concerns as you're able. Now, frankly, at this point, my job becomes a bit of a challenge. The last thing in the world you need from me is to go on at length about what I think about abortion or what I think about Roe versus Wade. Your professor has his or her views. You have yours. Neither of you needs my help in arriving at this deeply personal judgment. So I'm going to stop right here in the sense of discussing whether Roe was correctly decided or not. That's your call, not mine. But I do want to try to help you prepare to discuss this issue on a con law exam The best way to do that, I think, is simply to make three observations, fairly extended observations, about Roe versus Wade and the general field of fundamental rights. The point of these observations is not to tell you what to think. It's not to persuade you of a particular point of view. It is to give you some raw material that you can use in answering a con law essay question. So here goes, three observations on fundamental rights. First, it is a great mistake to think of Roe versus Wade as methodologically unique. A great mistake to think of Roe versus Wade as if it were the only time the Supreme Court has created non-textual rights. On the contrary, Roe is part of a long tradition of fundamental rights, most of which are more or less, frankly, non-textual. For example, Roe follows Griswold. And abortion is not mentioned in the Constitution, neither is contraception. Roe and Griswold both follow Meyer versus Nebraska. As far as I know, the Constitution says nothing about learning foreign languages and Pierce versus Society of Sisters, dealing with the right to attend private rather than public schools.